Thanks for that, Phoebe, uh, and good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for, for attending. I think there's, there's quite a lot of interest again in tonight's meeting, which is great. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about um, practical ultrasound of the, the kidneys. Um, and like I did um, the last few times, um, I'll start with my tip of the day, and that is to never, ever perform a a lone kidney scan, or for that matter, um, never ever perform a lone organ scan because you'll miss something and ultimately it will come back to bite you. So that leads me on to my ultrasound motto, um, and I've been talking about this ultrasound motto for, for many years now, um, and that is, if you don't look, you won't find. Um, but if you do look and look closely, you may find something juicy and unexpected. So here we go, um, patient preparation. Um, so accessing the, or assessing the kidneys um, requires quite a high clip. Um, so I would always make sure that the owner is aware um, just how high you're going to go with your clip and make sure that, that you've got consent um, before you do that. Um, you don't want to upset owners. Um, it's also quite important to, um, to make a, a nice neat job of it. Um, so like this dog on the right, it's, it's done nicely and neatly and it's high. I'd probably argue that um, there's not enough being clipped just um, over the, the caudal ribs there as well, but um, that would be being picky. Um, so um, the other thing we need to think about is that um, sometimes with kidneys to get access, you need to do an intercostal approach, which would be um, the 11th to 12th intercostal spaces, usually on the right, which is the kidney that sits um, furthest cranially. Um, I like my patients to be sedated um, for abdominal ultrasound scans, and that's more important um, when you're thinking about um, getting up to the kidneys, because sometimes you have to really squeeze reasonably firmly um, under the rib cage to get up and get access to the kidneys. Um, and as I said before, just remember that the right kidney sits more cranially, so it, it is um, harder to access. Um, I've talked about this before, but just as a reminder for all you learner drivers out there, um, it's important to um, start with the abdominal preset on your machine. It's no good doing a cardiology preset when you're going to have a look at the kidneys. Um, and then remember the four magic buttons. So these are the four buttons that you're most likely to um, change as you're doing your abdominal ultrasound scan. So these would be the depth, the gain, the time gain compensation and the focus. Um, and don't forget that um, the frequency that you select um, has an effect on the, the degree of penetration. The lower frequency, the better penetration. The higher frequency, um, the poorer penetration, but the better resolution that you'll get. And then for fine tuning, um, uh, and if you want to fine tune your contrast, um, you would be wanting to change the compression. So if you want more of a contrast image, like what we've got on the right here, um, you would want to have a low dynamic range um, for better, or sorry, for less contrast, um, but more fine gray, gray scale, you would want to have a, a high dynamic range. And then this button that I love that you find in a lot of ultrasound machines, which is the zoom, um, where you can really zoom into an area of interest. That's a great thing to have. So I use that um, all, I, I, almost on every organ when I'm doing a, an abdominal ultrasound scan. So that's the, um, the kind of basic setup and getting you started. So if we talk about the kidneys, um, there's usually two of them. Um, I say usually, uh, you do get some patients that only have one kidney. I've never seen one yet, um, but uh, it does happen. Um, so two kidneys, um, you have the left kidney, um, which sits adjacent to the aorta um, and um, uh, the left renal artery. Um, the right kidney sits closer to the caudal vena cava, and you've got the renal artery um, um, that, that goes into the hilus there as well. Um, and um, I, next to the, um, the adrenal gland, you have the phrenico abdominal artery and vein. These are tiny little things, but um, as you start to really look at these things in detail, you do get your eye in for these things, um, and you can actually see them. Um, so at the, at the high list, you would expect to have a renal artery, a renal vein, uh, and not forgetting the, the ureter. 
So what does it look like on, um, on ultrasound? Um, so the normal kidney on ultrasound um, has got three regions that we, three major regions that we recognize. So we have the outer cort cortex, which is um, a media mechagenicity structure, um, and then the medulla, which is hypoechoic, and then the renal sinus and the peripelvic fat, um, which has got quite a bright central echo. So if we just look at this in a bit more detail, what we'd expect is that the renal cortex would be finely textured. Um, and if we look at the echogenicity, um, we would expect it to be isoechoic or hypoechoic when we compare it to the liver, um, or um, it would be hypoechoic if we compare it to the spleen. The actual medulla um, is very hypoechoic, sometimes ano anechoic, so it's very black. Um, but don't confuse that with the renal pelvis. That is not the renal pelvis, that is the medulla. Um, the renal pelvis is something that you don't normally see in a normal case, you know, unless maybe the, the case is on IV fluids, um, or if you're using a high frequency probe and, and you're really zooming in. Um, but I would expect um, the renal pelvis, um, anything uh, under two millimeters would be normal. So if it's if it's greater than two millimeters, um, then I would be thinking that that's abnormal and, and thinking of reasons why the renal pelvis is actually um, dilated. So in terms of assessing um, renal echogenicity, um, I said that the, the renal cortex is usually isoechoic or hypoechoic to the liver. Um, so if we um, look at this uh, image that I've put in here, um, we have the right kidney, and the right kidney sits right against, tight against the caudate lobe of the liver um, in that renal fossa. So that's a, a good place to be able to assess the echogenicity of the, the kidneys. So we're expecting it to be about the same echo texture, the same echogenicity um, uh, as the, the liver, um, or slightly hypoechoic compared to the liver. If we look at the, um, the comparison between the kidney and the spleen, the left kidney sits um, up against the spleen. So you can get this image where you've got the spleen um, adjacent to the kidney um, and the renal cortex is, is usually almost hypoechoic to the spleen. So these are things you can't eyeball them. Um, you have to actually compare against the surrounding structures um, to really assess the, the echogenicity. But that's important um, when it comes to diagnosing um, renal abnormalities because a lot of renal abnormalities um, cause the renal cortex to become hyperechoic. And I'll talk about that a little bit further on. So how do I locate the kidneys? Um, locating the kidneys, some, some vets actually find this really quite challenging. Um, and the way that I, uh, I find the kidneys if, if I'm struggling um, is to find the aorta, the mid portion of the aorta. Um, and then I use my hand-eye coordination and slide in a cranial direction. Um, and I slide forward um, until I find the left renal artery. And the left renal artery forms a, a hook-like structure. So it coasts, uh, on this image here, um, cranial is to my left, caudal is to my right. Um, so the actual renal artery um, coasts caudally first from the aorta, and then it, it coasts cranially um, towards the kidney. You can see it just if I play this video now. Um, so we have this hook that's formed um, by the renal artery. Um, and when you see that and you've got the aorta, then what you want to do is fan dorsolaterally um, uh, to find the kidney. Um, and usually it will sit in that location. You can actually see this, uh, the adrenal gland just sitting in here as well. So how do we how do we actually go about scanning the whole kidney? Um, we're into um, scanning like we do with every organ in a longitudinal plane um, and then in a short axis plane as well. So my starting point would be the image in the middle here, um, which is scanning the mid portion um, of the left kidney. And if you look at the angle of, that the probe's pointing at, it's pointing really quite extremely, um, almost dorsally and cranially. Um, so I would start, get the kidney, and then what I would do is rotate my probe um, so that I can fully elongate the long axis of the kidney. So I'm seeing the maximum length of that um, kidney and long axis. And then what I would do 
yet the image on the right here is fan medially and go right off the end of the kidney and then come back to the mid portion and then fan um, laterally off the kidney. That way that I can say that I've seen all of that kidney in a long axis plane. And this is what I, this would look like. So this was um, my dog just done very briefly this afternoon. And so what I'm doing is I've got the kidney in long axis and I'm fanning um, medially and laterally all the way off. And then once you've, um, you've assessed the kidney in the longitudinal plane, what I would then do is rotate my probe 90 degrees. And so in this image in the, the middle, what you can see is I've rotated the probe 90 degrees. Um, and so the button is to the dog's spine. Um, and then what you want to do is fan cranially um, until you go right off the, the cranial portion of the kidney. Um, and then fan caudally until you go right off the caudal portion of the kidney. Um, and the reason that, that we want to do that is because a lot of lesions you find are at the cranial or the caudal pole. And if you don't actually um, actively look at the cranial and caudal pole uh, and look at the extremities, you're bound to miss something. So this is uh, just fanning cranial and caudally um, in the short axis. So just all the way through. Now I'd normally do this um, at a much slower speed, but um, I've just done this video quickly so that you can see what I'm talking about so that it makes sense. So that was the left kidney. What about the right kidney? Um, so in these three images, um, this is my dog um, and her head is to the right now um, and her tail is to the left. So she's in the left lateral recumbency. Um, and the starting point for the longitudinal plane, um, you tend to have to tuck right up and under the ribs to get this. And it can be a tight squeeze in some cases to get that longitudinal plane. Um, you would then, if you can get it from that, um, uh, that location, what I would then do is rotate 90 degrees. So that's the image on the right. Um, and then fan cranial and caudally, the same as you did on the left side. Um, and in the longitudinal plane, you would be fanning dorsally and ventrally. If you really struggle to, to find the kidney and get access to the kidney, then consider looking through the intercostal spaces. And it's usually um, at the, the 11th to the 12th intercostal spaces. So in terms of um, optimizing the image of the kidney, um, if you just think about these four magic buttons that I, that I keep talking about, um, so what you want to do is set the depth so that the kidney fills about three quarters of the screen. There's no point in having a tiny little kidney at the top of the screen um, where you really can't see much detail at all. Fill the, get, make the kidney fill the, the screen, okay? So depth first, then focus, get your focal point um, in line with the kidney. Um, you can increase the number of focal points. Um, so you could put two or three, three focal points um, in position of where the kidney is, but do remember that that does slow down the frame rate. Um, so I, in my experience, I would probably just use a couple of focal points um, to, to get the best imaging of the kidney. Um, time gain compensation, this is this um, gain switch for different parts of the screen. And I would just adjust that accordingly once I've, once I've got my image in the middle of the screen so that I've got a nice even image. And then if you just think about the frequency that you're operating at, um, what I would do is change the frequency um, so that you can optimize the, um, the quality of the image as much as possible. And um, so high frequency probably for a smaller dog or a cat, lower frequency to get the penetration for a, a larger dog. Um, if you want to improve your image optimization even further, you could swap to a linear probe, and this is a lovely um, linear probe on the P50. Um, and what I've done, the, the limitation with the, the linear probes is that you tend to get a square um, sector, um, but there is a, a, a function called trapezoid that you can use, and that widens out your sector a little bit. You do lose a little bit of the um, the, the definition, I think, um, it's not just quite as precise and clean, um, but um, it, it allows you to have a slightly wider um, sector. Um, and I think that's nice where you want to really get as much detail of the kidney as possible. 
artifacts and pitfalls, I suppose the, the main one to look out for um, is that the peripelvic fat um, can cause a shadowing artifact. So you get this the shadowing artifact um, beyond that. So these are not um, calculi. There's no bright um, echo bouncing off a, a solid structure. Um, this is just some, uh, some artifact that's, or shadowing artifact that's coming from the, the fat. So what other structures are there um, to consider that sit close to the kidney? Um, so the adrenals sit immediately adjacent to the kidneys. Um, so in this view, um, what we've got and the view on the left, we have got the aorta and the color flow box is showing the renal artery, that hook that you can see. And under that hook, we've got a peanut shaped um, left adrenal gland. Um, and if you actually look at the color flow signal going right through the middle of that, um, that is the phrenico abdominal artery vein that, that run there. That's that little vessel that I showed you before at the beginning of the, the talk. Um, without the color flow, here's a, a, a different dog, but um, uh, the left adrenal again. So you can see the aorta, you can see the um, left renal artery and vein that, um, that sit over the top of the aorta. Um, and for locating purposes, um, just to, to get your, your bearings, um, the left kidney would be up um, top left of each of these um, images that you've got here, okay? Um, other structures uh, nearby to the, uh, to the kidney, on the left side, the left kidney sits next to the spleen. Um, so sometimes you can see the spleen sat immediately adjacent. Um, and that's where you can assess the uh, echogenicity of the, the cortex compared to the spleen. Um, and on the right, right hand side, the right kidney sits, as I said before, um, in that caudate lobe in the renal fossa. Um, so it sits immediately adjacent to the, to the liver. Um, so again, it's useful for assessing the, the echogenicity of the cortex. What else do we see next to the kidney? Um, on the, the right hand side, um, the duodenum sits um, next to the kidney and a lot of dogs it actually comes right over the top of the kidney. Um, so again, this was my dog this afternoon and I did briefly for this. Um, and what you can see is the the duodenum, and I've, I have to just um, fan ever so slightly to see the duodenum sitting against the kidney. Um, in some dogs, the duodenum will come right, right over the top of the kidney um, with this, this imaging, um, with this view. If I uh, get the duodenum and rotate my probe 90 degrees, um, so the button goes 90 degrees to the, uh, to the dog's spine, um, then you get this view here. Um, so here's a duodenum now in short axis um, on the right. Um, and if you get the duodenum on the right in short axis and the kidney on the left in short axis, the pancreas normally sits in that um, area between the duodenum and the kidney as a triangular structure. Um, so I've outlined that just so that you can see it. Um, and in the, the middle of that, you get the pancreatico duodenal vessels um, so if I just play the next video, you'll see, so duodenum on the left, pancreas forming that triangular shape um, in the middle, um, and the kidney uh, on the, the left. Did I say duodenum on the left? I, should, I meant duodenum on the right of the screen, that is. So how do we assess renal size? Um, in cats, it's an absolute value. So um, we tend to say that cats' uh, kidneys measure 30 to 45 millimetres in length. Um, to assess canine kidneys, um, what we do is we index this to the, uh, the aorta. So what we do is a renal to aortic ratio. And in dogs, the renal to aortic ratio that's published is 5.5 to 9.1. The way that you do that is you, um, you take the kidney, maximize its length, um, and you measure the length of the kidney. Um, and you divide that by the width of the aorta round about where the, the kidney is located. So renal to aortic ratio is renal divided by aorta. And I've got this um, set up in my own ultrasound machine. It does it automatically for me, it does the calculation. So that as I'm doing a scan, I can just say, okay, renal to aortic ratio is X, and this kidney is smaller than expected or it's bigger than expected. Um, and here's a nice example of, of this in action. So this is a, a 
puppy that had a suspected cord systemic shunt and um, the kidneys were huge um, and I did a quick renal to aortic ratio and as you can see the renal to aortic ratio on the right was um, 16.3 um, and on the left it was 16.1 so these were huge kidneys. What else can you do um, with your imaging? Um, we have two types of um, colour flow Doppler. Um, on the left, we've got um, colour flow Doppler, um, which uh, it shows you um, the blood flow within the kidneys and it gives you some directional information. So um, blue is um, any um, flow away from the probe and red is any flow towards the probe. Um, power Doppler doesn't give you any directional information um, but uh, it's, it's better at um, defining very small low velocity flow as well. And that becomes useful where, you, for example, if you've got a mass, um, you can see that the, um, the, the vasculature has been disrupted by the, the presence of a mass. So into some of the more abnormal things that we see, um, if we start with hydronephrosis, um, so uh, with hydronephrosis, dilation of the renal pelvis and ureter, um, it can actually be unilateral or bilateral depending on the cause. Um, and it, what I would say is that in normal patients, the renal pelvis and ureters are too small to be seen, um, you know, unless you've got a, an animal that's maybe on IV fluids um, or unless you're really, really looking um, very closely at the kidneys. So as I said before, dilation, we would... Um, class is anything greater than two millimeters um, at the pelvis when we take that measurement. And the differentials for um, hydronephrosis are um, chronic renal disease, pyelonephritis, obstruction of the ureters, um, and I would say urolithes are the most common. But don't forget um, iatrogenic ligation. So if we look at the images on the, the right of the screen, um, this is a, a cat that presented with hydronephrosis. Um, so the right kidney looks fairly normal. The left kidney, you can't really see any um, texture to that at all. Um, and this was actually an iatrogenic um, ligation. Not me, um, I would say, um, I have to say. Um, so this is a cat who was spayed um, and the ureter must have got caught in the sutures. Um, and that had caused the dilation of the, the ureter um, and leading to um, hydronephrosis. So this, this cat um, developed the hydronephrosis. Um, it must have been um, over quite a long period of time. Um, and this cat had, had multiple problems as a result of that. So what about um, diffuse parenchymal disease? Diffuse parenchymal, parenchymal disease um, is usually either congenital or acquired. Um, so the clue with congenital is that cases often present in renal failure less than a year old. Um, so what we're looking for generally are small kidneys that are diffusely hyperechoic um, with poor cortical modulary distinction. Um, so it, it's difficult to, to really see where the, the junction is between the cortex and the medulla. And you might find that the outline is irregular. Um, with acquired re uh, renal disease, um, I'm being a bit vague here, but um, let's say chronic renal insufficiency, um, the changes that you get are nonspecific. But what you'd expect to see are things like a hyperechoic cortex um, with enhanced cortical medullary distinction or in some diseases, um, both the cortex and the medulla are hyperechoic. Um, and so therefore you get a reduced cortical medullary definition. But also be aware that um, you know, some kidneys, animals with severe kidney disease um, and severely elevated um, kidney parameters, um, the kidneys can appear completely normal on, on ultrasound. Um, Something else that, that we sometimes see is a uh, medullary rim sign. Um, and medullary rim sign is a, a hyperechoic band um, that's seen at the cortical medullary junction. Um, and it can be seen in several disease processes. Um, I think when I was first taught about it, they talked about um, acute uh, tubular necrosis, so ethylene glycol poisoning. Um, but I think the textbooks now say that you can see it in nephrocalcinosis, leptospirosis, 
high granulus vasculitis caused by FOP, FIP. Um, but it can also be seen in normal dogs and cats, so just be aware of that. Um, the textbooks say it's not an accurate indicator of renal disease, um, but medullary rim sign could represent uh, early renal disease or a past um, insult. So this is what it looks like. So this is a, a cat that you can see. You can see quite clearly a, a bright um, echogenic line and um, separating the, the cortex and the medulla. Um, and I've just put in a couple just so that you can get an idea of what it looks like. I think once you once you get your eye in for this, you, you'll never miss one. It's quite spectacular. And here's another one again, different case again. So we do see these out there in practice. So what about focal parenchymal lesions? Um, we get things like nephilis, urolis, we get cysts, we get renal infarcts, um, and we get masses. Um, so just to give you a flavor of, of some of these things, um, Nephiliths and duraliths, you tend to get a bright echo um, where the nephilith is, um, and then a distal shadowing artifact if the urolith or the nephilith is big enough um, to cause an artifact. Um, and with large urolithes, sometimes they'll form within the, the renal pelvis and take up the whole pelvis. So it, it takes on the shape of the whole pelvis, and that's what, what you classify as a staghorn appearance. So here's, here's a case. Um, so this case, I, I scanned this cat. This is quite a few years old, this, um, this image. But I scanned this cat, um, and the actual nephilith here was an incidental finding. This cat had palpable, palpably massive kidneys. Um, and when I scanned this cat's kidneys, um, this cat had... Um, the reason the kidneys were so big was because the, the perirenal fat was, um, was massively... Um, increased in size um, and there was a whole load of edema so these black lines that you can see in the fat is actually edema uh, in the perirenal fat and this cat turned out to have um, I'll tell you in a minute um, this is 12 months later I asked the owner um, if uh, if it was would be okay to to do a post-mortem when, when this cat was um, euthanized in the end. Um, and this is what we find. So the, here was the, the nephiliths um, in the middle of the kidney um, and the perirenal fat, um, maybe not so spectacular as, as what we saw in the, the original ultrasound, um, but the perirenal fat was abnormal um, and the, the parenchyma of the kidney was, was very abnormal as well. Um, and I set that, sent this off um, out of interest um, and it came back as lymphosarcoma. Um, so there was edema there, um, as well as infiltration of the perirenal fat, um, and there was some mineralization, and there was um, a, a nice description of, of why that happens. Um, and a happy pathologist at the, at the end, thank you for the images, it's always helpful to see the full picture. So um, I'm sure you all do it in these days um, with digital cameras and phones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but uh, yeah, it's always nice to, to let the pathologist see what, um, what they're looking at grossly, um, and they do appreciate it. So what other things do we see? We see renal cysts sometimes. So cysts in the cortex um, are a common finding in chronic renal disease. Um, single large cysts should be differentiated from solid or cavitatory masses um, and abscesses and hematomas. That would be your differentials. Um, and also, um, when you've got multiple cystic um, structures within the kidney, distorting the kidney, um, we need to be thinking about polycystic kidney disease. Um, and I'd be thinking about long-haired cats and cairn terriers. So here is, uh, is this case. And so this is me just sweeping back and forth. This is a relatively recent case that presented with um, renal failure. Um, or sorry, um, this, this, this dog had um, massively elevated kidney uh, enzymes. Um, and just scanning back and forth, and what we could see was, was some cysts here um, within the tissue. But as you look a little bit closer, there's multiple ones. And this is why I say that you should, um, you should really make sure that you scan right off the end of the kidney. So you, know, you may miss things if you don't actually scan right off the end. So we're just really at, the, at the, the extremity of the kidney and you can, see, you can see that there's some cystic structures. So there's the obvious one at the beginning that you can see. And then as we just sweep off the end of the kidney, 
here we are, we've got, we've got some here and here and here. So that's renal cysts. What else do we see? Um, we sometimes see renal infarcts. Um, and infarcts tend to be wedge-shaped or linear. Um, and they're well-defined lesions. You would expect to find them in the cortex. So here's one here. So it's wedge-shaped. Um, chronic infarcts tend to be hyperechoic. Um, and if you can scan across the, the surface of the kidney, sometimes you'll see a, a depression in the cortex as well. Um, so this was the this was the case. Here's a video of it. And you can just see as I sweep back and forth, my eye was drawn very quickly to, to this area here. But me being inquisitive um, and with my motto, if you don't look, you won't find. My next question was, okay, infarct. So what's, what, where's that come from? Why is it there? Um, and that led me eventually to um, scan the, the heart. Um, and this dog had quite a spectacular endocarditis going on. So what you can see here uh, is the, the vegetation on the mitral valve. This dog also had some splenic um, issues as well. But yeah, if you don't look, you won't find. Here's another view of the endocarditis, just to show you how spectacular that, that is. And then this is, this is a, a, a nine-year-old collie that, that presented with um, hematuria. Um, and I was asked to scan this dog. Um, and this is what I found. Um, so a massive um, mass within the kidney. Um, and it was obstructing the uh, renal pelvis. It was obstructing the outflow. So therefore causing hydronephrosis. So the only bit of normal kidney that you can see is around the edge here. So you can see a bit of cortex and a bit of medulla, but mainly what you're seeing is a, is a, a massive hydronephrosis um, because of the, the mass that you've got going on um, there. So with color flow Doppler, um, I actually used the color flow Doppler just to, to, um, to, to, to look at the blood flow around the area. But I also used that before um, I did a fine needle aspirate because I was trying to find a, a nice safe window uh, into this mass that I wasn't going to cause any nasty bleeding um, so that I could take a fine needle aspirate. Um, so I recommended, ba based on, um, on the, the cytology that can be back, I recommended a, a CT scan. Um, and this was the, the CT scan. And what we were looking for was to see if there was any evidence of, of um, spread anywhere else. And in actual fact, my abdominal ultrasound scan didn't find uh, any evidence of spread anywhere. Um, and the CT scan um, didn't find any evidence of spread either. Um, so that's the one view. And there's the other view that you can see here. So quite a spe spectacular um, case. So what we did in this case eventually was we decided to um, to open this up um, and the kidney was removed uh, and, and this dog this is it's over 12 months now I think and this dog is still doing very well. Um, the, the actual histopathology was um, was not awfully helpful because it came back as a, a tumour of uncertain origin so we didn't actually get a definitive diagnosis in this case. Here's another one. Um, so what we can see on the cranial pole of this kidney is a mass um, and there's some cavities to it as well. Um, and if you have a look at the color flow on this, um, this patient, you can see that the color flow is disrupted um, or the, the blood vessels are disrupted by the, the mass, um, which is really pushing everything around the edges. Um, so my next question was, okay, there's a mass on the kidney. Um, is there anything else interesting going on? Um, uh, so back to my motto, if you don't look, you won't find. Um, I looked at the spleen um, and there was something else going on in the spleen, mass or thrombus or something. Um, and there appeared to be spread into the splenic vein. Um, so once I had completed my abdominal ultrasound scan, I thought, okay, well, where does the splenic vein go to? It goes to the caudal vena cava. The caudal vena cava goes back to the heart. So let's just have a look and see what's going on. And surprisingly, um, again, quite a spectacular um, finding in this dog's heart. So there was masses or 
um, some sort of thrombus um, going on in both the right atrium and the left atrium. And I thought I would end with a, um, another spectacular case. Um, so this is taken quite a few years ago now, um, but this was a cat that presented, um, the owner complaint at least was that he was constipated. Um, and, you know, as you do, I looked at the cat and saw this swollen abdomen and I thought, oh, this is going to be another blocked cat. Um, and I put the probe on and the first second after I put the probe on, uh, I saw this fluid filled structure and I thought, yeah, that's more likely to, you know, it's going to be a blocked cat for sure. Um, but then as I swept with the probe, um, there was this structure that came in the middle of it. And then I found on the other side, another structure. So having seen that, these are kidneys that you can see in the middle. Um, and these are perinephric pseudocysts. So if you've never seen one, that's what a perinephric pseudocyst can look like. Um, quite spectacular on x-ray as well. Um, there we are. So how does it know it was a pseudocyst? Um, I had read an article about it somewhere, you know, way back in the, the distance years ago. Um, and uh, so that, that's how I knew to, to label it as a pseudocyst. Um, there's some blood flow. But by the way, the quality of this image is, uh, is not very great and it's just down to, to the way it was captured um, all these years ago. It's not actually down to the, the ultrasound image. So what did I do? Um, it, 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 Immediately what I did was I passed a, a, a needle into the, um, into the fluid and drew off the fluid um, and what we got was 700 mils of, of clear fluid, which is quite a large volume. Um, that gave me time to then find the article and read up about it because um, I was expecting it to come back and one week later this cat came back um, and the, 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 the kidneys or the pseudocysts were, were exactly the same as they were originally. Um, so what we did is we had a discussion and we decided to um, resect and mentalize the, um, the pseudocyst. Yeah. Um, so what I did um, was initially took the fluid out of the cysts. I didn't know whether that fluid was going to be um, contaminated or not. So I, I attempted to suck it all out um, and not allow any of it to drain into the abdomen at all. Um, so you can, what you can see here is this is the, the one pseudocyst and the kidney just below and here's the other pseudocyst over here. Um, and that's me just taking some of the fluid out. You can tell this is a few years ago because this is um, when, when I used to use the, the green cloths. So that, that, was, that was the actual video of the, the op. Uh, and what I decided to do in this case was I um, mentalized, so I resected the whole pseudocyst uh, and I mentalized um, this um, so that we could get some sort of drainage of any uh, fluid that would form. Um, and uh, that cat made a, a full recovery. And in, in actual fact, um, he, he lasted I think something like 17 years old he got to. Um, so he did very well with that. So um, an unusual one just to, to, to end. Um, so I'll finish off with some questions. If anyone has any questions for me, I hope you enjoyed that. Can you mention about renal artery and vein Doppler and flow abnormalities? Um, yeah. Is that, a whole, is that a whole other presentation in itself? <laughs> Um, well, it, it could be. Um, I suppose the main one that that I I used to fuss about was um, something called res resistive index. Um, and uh, what what you do with that is a um, you do pulse wave Doppler um, interrogation of of the um, the arcuate arteries in the kidneys, um, and you look at the peak systolic flow, and you look at the um, the, the diastolic flow um, and you measure the velocities in systole and diastole um, and the resistive index um, you get uh, uh, by di dividing the well, it's, it's peak systolic velocity um, minus the, um, the end diastolic velocity divided by the peak systolic velocity um, and you get a value and, and what they used to say was that a value greater than 0.7 is abnormal 
Um, but and, and it was reported um, that you see it in ureteral obstruction um, and acquired renal diseases. Um, but if you actually look at the textbooks now, um, what they say is, is it's quite a non-specific thing and it, so it's seldom used in clinical practice. I don't actually use it anymore. So in terms of color flow Doppler um, and pulse wave Doppler, et cetera, um, I tend to use these um, for locating renal arteries, renal veins. Um, I, I use it for if I'm struggling to find um, the adrenal glands, um, I use it for that. Um, and I use it to locate this, the phrenico abdominal artery and vein because they're important. We'll talk about that um, when we get on to um, adrenal diseases and adrenal changes. Um, there are some adrenal tumors that seem to like to um, metastasize up the phrenico abdominal um, vein and into the caudal vena cava um, and into the body that way. Um, so that would be my main use for um, color flow Doppler. Um, uh, and then just mapping, um, mapping blood flow around um, uh, 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 masses and that sort of thing, um, just like what we what we discussed this evening. Thank you yeah. very very much again, Mark. No problem. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming along, and uh, thanks to Celtic SMR for for actually arranging all this and putting it all together.